Hello, my name is Phoebe Legere and welcome to Roulette TV. This evening my guest is composer Henry Threadgill from Chicago, Illinois. Roulette TV is very honored to present Henry Threadgill.
Jose Davila. Elliot Cabe. Liberty Armin. Stumble. Okay. Christopher Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of Dewey. Thank you. I'm here with composer Henry Threadgill. What is the name of the composition that you played tonight? Uh, that was entitled, All the Way Light Touch. That was a roulette commission? Yes. How much of it is improvised and how much of what you do is composed? It depends on the, how long we want to play a piece, the, the uh, improvisational time. However, not in this performance, but we, could, we can in other performances, we can expand the length of time that the notated material is played because the, the music that I'm writing at, at this part or period is modular. The notated music is all modular. It's like modular furniture, like you have a centerpiece, a seat, and you have a piece on the left, you have a piece on the right. All of these things can be moved around. Together they're com combo, but they don't strictly have to go one, two, three, four. They can go one, three, two, four, or any combination thereof. Can you talk about the musical material, the intervallic material in the modules for this piece? All of the material, the total amount of written material, is in blocks. It's composed of blocks, of intervallic blocks. There's a um, gravitational system that's based on those intervals. That means that everything will hang together there through a force field from the mere fact that this is the only thing in play. There will be other intervals that are a, a result of spinning off of those particular primary intervals. <laughs> Have you ever invented your own notational systems? It's not so much uh, that one has to invent a system. The system has to, a uh, notation system has to be a result of the fact that the, it, uh, the, it's a demand for it in what you're doing. It's like, you know, you get up one day and you say, look, I can't wear this uh, jacket anymore. <laughs> right? You know, so you, get, so you go to the drawing table. You say, <laughs> you know, you go to the drawing table and say, I got to get another jacket. You know, exactly. so these, these jackets that I'm getting from... From, uh, from, <laughs> from Dabs, the ones that I'm getting from Kmart, the one from like Ira Smith, they're not fitting me properly. A lot of times people are forcing their material into a notational system that is the incorrect notational system for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So you might have to modify. I, right now I'm into doing some modification of, because uh, I use a standard kind of system, but it's, it has to be understood. I use standard system, but you still have to understand how I, everything is put together there. We can say that anything is standardized, but once you arrange things in a room, you say, now, wait a minute, what is a chair doing on top of the refrigerator? <laughs> See what I'm saying? It's standard that the chair should be in the kitchen, but it's generally not on top of the refrigerator. Beautiful. I was hoping that you would share with me and with the young people who listen to Roulette TV Mm -hmm. some of the intellectual and social ideas that were being talked about during those early days of the AACM. The ideas that were floating around were the ideas that each one of the composers uh, had that you would find yourself in front of. You had to be able to sit there and take instruction from anyone who was being the leader at the time that was presenting and you were working on their music. Whatever they told you was the approach, the philosophy, and the ideas, that's when we heard all of the different types of um, uh, ideas and formats and ways to conceive music. This philosophy of creative freedom 
and respect, mutual respect, seems to have given you a very solid foundation that has been a good place to play music from for your whole life. In fact, you have been spectacularly successful. Yeah, but that's been internationally. You know, this, yeah, but this is this has not been an easy uh, to talk about this to say this was very difficult. This was a uh, this was a challenging growing experience for each one of us because yes. these things were challenging uh, to people's principles. So this took years of uh, patience because you had to realize people people had to be people too. They you you're an artist, but you're a person too. You react as a person emotionally and intellectually. So when a person gets up and there's some music that you just can't seem to get a hound on, you, you might begin to react to it. So you might, you, next thing you know, your mouth is open. So <laughs> <laughs> chat, 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 chat about it. And that's, this is what's been a growing experience. And so over the years, and as the different artists, you know, Muhal and Braxton and Wadala and Roscoe Mitchell, these different composers, uh, uh, Amina Claudine Myers, as their work advanced, their work have advanced, and so you have to advance with it. When um, when we've been in positions to play each other's work, you know, when we had to, when I had to sit at the at the at the table and play somebody else's music over the years, you know, you have to give them. They're the king, so, so there is no one direction. But what it is, it's a challenge of patience and a challenge of democracy in order to let something that is totally different from what you do have equal time, equal credibility, and equal respect. And in time, even if someone's work, you don't grasp it, in time, if you're patient long enough, you, could, you might still come in late and learn something. Can you talk about how you how you generate these ideas for sounds that are, are so original. I really don't know. <laughs> I'm just glad that I have these ideas when, they do, when I'm lucky enough to be visited by one. But you and do I, have a classical background, right, somewhat? But you, you, have a, you, had a, you, had a compo uh, you studied composition, right? Yeah, up until, what, sometime that, that by the beginning of the 90s, late 80s, all of a sudden now you, you got these programs where people can study to be a jazz musician, can be a rock musician, pop musician. Before this, across the board, everyone, if you went to any conservatory, any university, any college, everybody studied European classical music. So that's, that's a given. There, there was nothing else to study. <laughs> that's it. You know, but a composer is, is, is a person, in my opinion, I say in my opinion, is a person that is always studying and studying everything that is out there. What tends to happen is that you get to a point in time when you feel like you've done everything that you can with something that you, it's, it's like a Rubik's Cube. You say, okay, I've done it. I'm, I, give me another Rubik's Cube. I've done every combination here. So the only way you can advance is that you've got some more information in your banks. Uh, what do you think about the thousands of jazz graduates com coming out of the schools, pouring out of the schools with their academic canon of how jazz should be played? Do you think it's healthy? How do you think, you know, any ideas about music education? How do you see it? Well, I think that all music needs to be taught. The world has gotten smaller and all of the young people walking around with gadgets in their hands and sticking out their pockets. So the world is very small. For you not to understand anything about the music of Indonesia or the music of India or understand everything about American composers from Horatio Parker on up, I mean, Henry Cowell, you know, or Aaron Cope and Vincent Peraschetti, you know, and all of the Europeans and everyone else to, to the Exclusion of all these people just to study specific jazz people, and then the, the, there is a, a, a concept that what is jazz? So these young people are coming out 
learning about certain, quote, jazz. They don't really know. They haven't even looked at like how broad that is. So they come out all kind of doing the same thing, or having information on the same thing. And they all have the same way of approaching something. I think it's a very bad idea uh, to tell any young people how to build a house. I think that's a serious mistake. I watched a, a doctor, a woman, of mathematics teaching children mathematics, very young children, and she went to the board, to a blackboard, and she wrote on the blackboard. She wrote a figure, she wrote another figure, and she wrote another figure, and she put a line, and she added it up. And then she erased it. And she didn't until she gave the children some figures and the children went to the board and they put the, the information on the board all kinds of ways. Children wrote the numbers this way, this way, wrote in uh, uh, symbols that had other representations in their mind. And they came out with the same answer, but they didn't follow her procedures. But when you looked at all of the, when you looked at the, all of the information that the children put up on the board in its entirety, what you saw was a very big picture of how things could be done. So is there any final thing that you would like to uh, impart to us? Uh, do you have a, any kind of a statement about, about the life of a musical artist who has made his own way in the world? Well, I don't know what I could say um, other than, I mean, the environment has changed so much. It's so unfriendly now, unfriendly toward artists. Uh, at New York being the, like one of the artistic, mainly the biggest artistic capital right now, it's, it's shameful uh, that this place is so unfriendly. And, and you think of the history of the people that came here all the way I mean, people like Dvorak was here, Bartok was here, you know, Jack Kuriak, Charlie Parker, all these people. And you, re and, and you read stories about people, actors, dancers, musicians, biographies and autobiographies where they said they wanted to come to New York, and they did. And they, were, they did stay in the Rockaways, they stayed in Manhattan. That's not possible anymore. But let me just fast forward a little bit there. What people have to understand is a way of life. It's a complete way of life. A complete way of life has to do with everything, economics, philosophy, and everything. It's not a department. It's your whole life. You have to adjust your whole life this way so that there's never any conflict, see, because otherwise you like, it's almost like an actor going in and out of character. Okay, you say, oh, it's so hard being a musician, it's so hard being a filmmaker. No, this is what you are all the time in every area of your life. What you have to do is balance every area of your life. Uh, for instance, is like, you don't get paid, uh, for, you're not on a nine to five schedule, you, get a, you don't get a paycheck every two weeks, so why are you behaving that way? Why are you spending money? that way? Why are you acting like you get money the way other people get money? <laughs> why are you changing your clothes the way other people change their clothes? Why are you doing these different things? So that's why I say it's a way of life. You have to find out what this way of life is and get control of this way of life and get power over this way of life because that's the only way that you can be content when, this, when things are really down. <laughs> so to speak, you know, because they will be up and down, but you will, you won't be, t feel, you won't feel like you're being tossed around in life because like, you know, you, you, you're not able to have martinis every day at two, so stop it, you know, <laughs> so, you know get a cheap cigar and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a delight to have you as our guest. I've been talking with Henry Threadgill, a walking, talking, blue chip representative <laughs> of, uh, of the great American music tradition. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you.